Well, if you've got your Bibles with you, again, we're going to be turning to the Gospel of John. If you're tuning in here for the first time and you're not one of our regulars, we've been working our way through the Gospel of John for a number of years, about two and a half, I think now. And we find ourselves in John 17. And so Jesus has finished teaching the disciples. We've gone through those chapters and heard all of his encouragements and exhortations and comforts and challenges. And now we're in the Garden of Gethsemane. And Jesus is praying. Obviously, this is before he falls down and pleads with God to take the cup away if it's possible. And the disciples have the joy of listening in and hearing this incredible prayer, which is often called the high priestly prayer of Jesus. And we're going to be looking at the first five verses. As I said to the kids, this can be broken up into three chunks. There's a few different ways of breaking it up, but we're going to break it up into three chunks over this in the next two weeks. And firstly, we're going to consider the first five verses. This is God's word for you this morning. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all flesh, to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, And Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. So far, the reading of God's word. May he bless it to our soul. Well, before we come to the preaching of God's word, let's just bow again in a time of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you richly bless us by speaking to us. And we pray now that as we open it up, that you would not leave us nor forsake us. And we thank you that you promise never to do that, but that you would speak. Lord, even now as we use this incredible technology to be able to open up your word together, and as I speak to a camera, Lord, I pray that you would carry your word through the internet into the hearts of your people, and that they would be nourished, fed, and built up, that we would see the glory of Christ through the preaching of your word. We pray this in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Well, have you ever wished that you could stare into the heart of someone? You know, like look into the heart and see the motives, see what they really believe, see what they really think about things. You know, because often we, we hear different bits and bobs, we hear different parts of what people think. But sometimes it would be lovely to be able to look in and really understand what's going on. Well, prayer, in a sense, gives us that. But not, not infallibly, of course, not like Jesus who looks into the hearts of a person and knows what their heart is. But I've often said to people that if you, if you really want to know what a person believes, listen to them pray. If you really want to know what a person believes, what a person desires, what a person wants, Listen to them pray. Now, it's, it's this same idea that would lead Spurgeon to comment that if you want to show an Arminian they're wrong and the fact that there's no such thing as an Arminian, he just said, just ask a person how they pray. Because if a person prays for someone to be saved, what do they say? They say, Lord, would you please save this person? Which, of course, you can't pray if you're an Arminian, can you? Well, it's, it's with this sort of an idea that when we come to Jesus, 
And when we hear Jesus praying, now if, if all of that's true, when we hear Jesus praying, we should take take stock, shouldn't we? We should stop and think and ask ourselves, well, if, if prayer is the, the overflow of the heart, as I said to the children, if the prayer, if prayer is like a window to the soul, and we hear Jesus praying, and, and not teaching his disciples to pray, like you think of the, the, the Lord's Prayer, we call it, when he teaches the disciples to pray, not like that, but when we just hear in John 17, where we hear Jesus pouring out his soul before his Father in heaven, pouring out his heart, pouring out his motives, pouring out his desires. We need to pay attention, don't we? Because there are some wonders to behold. Some wonders to behold. Well, as I, as I said, John 17 comes in somewhere in the Garden of Gethsemane. We're not really sure where. We know that they were in the upper room in John 12. And we know that somewhere in the middle, they leave. It tells us that they get up and leave. And they travel through. We get through 13, through 14, 15, 16. And then we find ourselves in John 17. And Jesus is praying. I think it's safe to assume we're in the Garden of Gethsemane at this point. And, and that's actually really, really important. And the reason that's important is that you and I know, looking back, what lies just before Jesus. Now, the disciples don't know that. In, in the other Gospels, we're going to see the disciples falling asleep. We're going to see the disciples lost and confused. But Jesus is there on his face pleading with God. And in a few moments, he's going to plead with God, if possible, take this cup away from me. But now we see him and, and John records and is inspired by the Holy Spirit to record for us an incredible prayer. And the first thing we see is, is the desires of Jesus for himself. The desires of Jesus for himself. What he wants. You see, in, in later sections, we're going to see what Jesus wants for the disciples and what Jesus wants for us. But here, in these first five verses, it's Jesus' desire for himself and for the Godhead. And firstly, Jesus desires... <coughs> excuse me. Jesus desires glorification. Have a look at verse 1. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven. It's a beautiful picture, isn't it, of Jesus' relationship to his Father. He doesn't grovel in the dirt, but he lifts up his face to his Father. He lifts up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. So Jesus desires glorification. He desires glory for himself. It's interesting, isn't it? Glorify your Son. Now, it's interesting because if you and I prayed that, it would be a sin, wouldn't it? Glorify me. Can you imagine me standing here and, and praying during our congregational prayer? And God, glorify Logan. That would be heretical, wouldn't it? Because glory is only due to God. Only God is worthy of glory. We, we are told in the New Testament that we as the people of God are, are taken up into his glory, but only God is worthy to be praised. Only God is praiseworthy. And yet Jesus says, glorify me, glorify your son. Why can he say that? He can say that because he's God, isn't he? It's one of these amazing little just like, Small little one-liners that point 
to the reality of who God is. Point to the depths of the mystery of the Son of God. But, but notice, he doesn't purely pray for his glory, does he? But he says, glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you. And here we begin to see the, the Trinity at work and what we call mutual glorification. The fact that in, in, within the intricate relationship of the Trinity, the, the Father is glorifying the Son and the Son is glorifying the Father. And of course, the Holy Spirit's not mentioned, but we know from previous chapters that what's the Holy Spirit doing? He's casting a light upon the Son and upon the Father, and He's highlighting them, and He's showing their splendor. And so this Trinitarian God is worshiping and glorifying consistently. And Jesus asks for this to be filled. And this is really, really important for us because it, it really stresses that if Jesus is not glorified, God is not glorified. And so all these people, all these people who say, oh, Jude, Jews and Muslims and Christians, they all just worship the same God. Have you heard that before? Oh, Allah, God, they're just all versions of the same thing. Well, they're not. And when J-dubs turn up at your door and try to tell you that you've got the same God, they've just got a better understanding than you. And, and when Mormons do the same thing, you can say, no, we don't have the same God. You know why we don't have the same God? Because if you don't have Christ at the center of the glorification of the Godhead, you do not have the true God. Muslims don't worship God without Jesus. Jews don't worship God because they don't worship Christ. And if you take Christ out of the picture, you no longer have God. And this is why it's so absolutely fundamental that Christ is at the center of everything we do. The center of our worship, the center of our prayer meetings, the center of our family worship, the center of our households, the center of our relationships with one another, the center of our AGMs, the center of our worship services, the center of everything. Because without Christ, there is no true worship. This is why Jesus says to the woman at the well, I tell you, a time is coming where you will worship in spirit and in truth. Why? Because they would find Jesus. See, only, only true worship is rooted in Jesus Christ. All other forms of worship are adulterous idolatry. You know, it's, it's really hard to find, to find an illustration that helps us understand the way the Son and the Father interact together because there's nothing on earth like it. But the, the closest I could think of, and, and maybe one of you will, will send me a message later and say, oh, no, there's this great illustration. But the closest I could come up with is a little bit like the way in a, hu a husband and a wife interact together. I can remember my minister growing up saying from the pulpit, he was preaching about submission and headship. And he said, the, you see, the wife, she submits to her husband and seeks to honor and respect and lift up her husband. And her husband constantly seeks to hop down and lovingly serve his wife. And so throughout eternity, for a husband and a wife, Throughout their life, there's not this gap of separation 
where the wife goes lower and the husband goes higher, but she seeks to lower herself and respect him and he seeks to lower himself and love her. And in this action, they draw nearer together. Isn't that true? When a husband lavishes love upon his wife and when she submits with utter respect and honor, this relationship draws nearer and nearer. And, and this is all, uh, just a really bad, small picture of what we see in Christ and the Father. The Son is glorifying the Father. He's saying, no, it's all about you. And the Father's saying, glorify my Son. He is lovely. He is beautiful. But notice where this happens. And this is, this is bizarre. In a sense, Jesus prays, Father, the hour has come. Glorify me. Up up till up till this point, up till the point of entering the upper room and coming here, we've heard the hour is not yet come. My hour has not yet come. My hour has not yet come. The hour has not yet come. Over and over and over and over and over and over again. And now Jesus says, Father, it's time. What's he referencing? He's referencing the cross, isn't he? He's referencing his humiliation upon the cross. And he says, Glorify me that I might glorify you upon the cross. You know, there are depths in the cross which we cannot comprehend, that we can't get our minds around. There's a reason we sing. The mystery of the cross I cannot comprehend. For example, at the same time upon the cross, Jesus cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And at that very same moment, Jesus is being glorified on the cross and the Father is being glorified in the Son. As, as one preacher put it, as one cries out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The other cries out, Well done, good and faithful servant. This is my Son in whom I am well pleased. We, we can't comprehend that, can we? We can't comprehend that. But you know what we can do? Is be stunned with awe and worship. See, that's the response, isn't it? The response is, woe is me that my sin caused this to happen, but then fall down and worship at the feet of God because he would do this. This is the desire of Christ that as he walks the road to Golgotha, as he gets nailed to a cross, that him and his father would be praiseworthy, would be cherishable, would be delightful, would be beautiful, would be magnificent, would be magnified. That that action of humiliation would act like a ginormous telescope that would bring the glory of God into, into sight. And it's exactly what happened, isn't it? How many millions of people walk in this world with a cross around their neck, a symbol of suffering and shame and torture and a symbol of glory, the glory of the cross, Paul says. 
But Jesus doesn't just desire glorification. He desires redemption. Verse 2 to 3. You have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. You see, the purpose of the cross, the the cross is not just a one-time accident event, is it? The purpose of the cross is, or the, the outworking of the cross is an, the outworking of something planned from before the ages. You know, theologians talk about different covenants, and one of the covenants they talk about is the covenant of redemption. Now, if you're thinking that's talking about us being saved, you're close. That it, it's refers to, and it's not a term that comes up in the Bible, it's just like a catchphrase that theologians use to, to reference something. But it's... It's the idea that before the foundation of the world, the triune God made a plan to save humanity. And that the the father asked the son to give up his life to save humanity. And the son agreed and they made a covenantal agreement together. To save you. And that it would culminate in the cross. And he he chooses based on this election. And we, we get a, a glimpse of this in Ephesians chapter 1. If you've got your Bibles with you, turn to the book of Ephesians in the New Testament. Ephesians chapter 1. In this stunning passage, it's all about election, salvation, and in verse 11 we read this. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined, predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of the truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, are sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. So we've been predestined according to his purpose, according to the counsel of his will. So think about this for a second. He predestines according to his purpose, according to his counsel. In other words, pointing all the way back, all the way back there, they they had counsel of wisdom and decision. And so they put together a plan, a purpose, which went all the way to the cross, and he predestined you to be saved out out of that cross. And so Jesus says, I'm going to the cross. I want you to be glorified, and I'm doing it. And out of that glorification, I want to do that which we plan to do. He's asking for God to carry out what he said, what they agreed to do before the beginning of time. And what was that plan? That eternal life would be made available. That eternal life would be applied to sinners. He says, he says, glorify yourself since or because or just as you've given me authority over all people, all flesh, all people, to do what? To give them eternal life. To all those, Father, who you gave me. So you get back in the purpose again. So before the foundation of the earth, the Father gives the Son some people, gives him the authority to give them eternal life. And you say, well, what is eternal life? And so often in the 21st century, we, we tend to just view eternal life as being living forever. You know, it doesn't help that half of our movies talk like this, doesn't it? 
think about Indiana Jones. You get the special cup, and if you drink the cup with the special juice in it or wine in it or whatever it's meant to be, you'll live forever. And, and scientists have said, oh, we, within our lifetime, we're going to figure out how not to die. I've heard a scientist say this. How? Because, you see, medical advancements and scientists are going to make you live longer. And after making you live longer, they're eventually going to work out how to make you live longer again. So by the end of your life, you'll live to be 150, 180. And, and then by the end of that life, the, they will have worked out how, to, how for you to live to 200. And by then, they would have worked out how to make it so you don't die. Now, for starters, living forever on this earth sounds really depressing. But secondly, that's not what Jesus is talking about, is it? Because he says in verse 3, this is eternal life. This is living forever. That they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Eternal life is having a relationship with Jesus Christ. Having an intimate acquaintance with him. You see, if you get to glory, if you get to heaven, let, let me say this a different way. Let me ask you a question. Let me ask you a question. If you can go to heaven, have no pain, live forever, have whatever you want, the perfect heavenly existence, you know, maybe for you it's the, the Muslim ideal of, you know, 50, 50 virgin wives and, you know, whatever it is. You think about the best heaven possible. If you can have that, but Jesus isn't there, are you happy? If you say yes, you don't understand eternal life. You don't understand what God is doing in salvation. Because eternal life is knowing him. And this is why eternal life doesn't start then. Eternal life starts now. We enter into the blessings of the covenant now. We enter into the rest now because we receive Christ now. And so from now onwards, Jesus is bringing us into a relationship with him, drawing us in, revealing more of himself that we might know the Father and the Son through the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. And so it, it begs to be asked, do you know him? Do you know him? Not have you prayed, not have you accepted him, not have you gone to an altar call, not have you been born in the church, do you know him? Like you could say, I know my husband, I know my child, I know my parent, an intimate, personable knowledge. Because Jesus died so that you could. The humiliation of Christ was so that you could have a relationship with him. Will you come? Will you come to him this morning? It doesn't require fanfare. It doesn't require anything but you and your sin that's all you bring to the table and you say God I want that type of eternal life I want to know you for eternity you see the you realize the biggest punishment of hell don't you the biggest punishment of hell is not hellfire and brimstone you know the real punishment of hell? The real punishment of hell is that people will get to glory. They will get to the sea 
Christ in his splendor and glory, and rather than enter into eternal joy and happiness with him, they will spend eternity knowing they missed out. This is what's so horrible for the people around us that don't know Jesus Christ. They're going to miss out on relationship. They're going to miss out on this type of thing. And they will spend forever and ever and ever regretting their decision and hating him for it. But not only does Jesus desire his glorification and his redemption, but lastly, Jesus desires his exaltation. Have a look at verse 4 and 5. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished this work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. The Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit agreed on a plan. The Father would send the Son. The Son would do his work. The Son would go to the cross. The Son would be humiliated. The Son would die. The Son would be raised. And the Son would be exalted. And now, and now, Jesus prays, I've done the work. I'm going to the cross. I'm going to complete my mission. Take me home to the place. I belong. And it's not West Virginia. It's glory. Isn't it? It says, take me back to be with you in glory again. You see, Jesus knows he's going to humiliation. He's going to the cross. He's going to cry out, why have you forsaken me? There's going to be this horrible experience of separation. And yet, as Hebrews puts it, for the joy set before him, he will endure the suffering and the shame of the cross. For the joy set before him, or in John's words, for the glory and exaltation coming, he will go through the cross and finish his mission. It's like all those old James Bond movies. I used to love the Sean Connery, James Bond movies when I was a kid. And at the end, there'd always be that scene, almost always, where James Bond would be sitting around somewhere on a beach or in some situation, looking very content and happy, with a drink in his hand and at peace. Why? Because he's done all that was required of him. And you know, in an infinitely greater sense, this is what is true for Jesus, isn't it? And he prays now that it would be done. That he would make it through to the other side. To the joy. To the accomplishment of all he's been working for. He longs for his ascension and his glory. He longs for the return of what we saw all those many moons ago in John 1. You remember John 1? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. He was face to face with God, as I've said many times. No one's ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side, who is In the bosom of the Father, he has made him known. And so Jesus says, I want to come back to your bosom. I want to come back and be face to face with you once more. I want to look into your eyes and be back in that exalted state again. You know, Short quiz in closing. Finish this sentence. The chief end of man 
and I'm sure you finished it. What's the chief end of God? The chief end of God is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. And that's exactly what we're seeing Jesus do here, isn't it? Glorify your Son and glorify yourself. Help me finish the redemptive plan from all eternity past. Restore me to exaltation that we might be maximally glorified and enjoy one another with your people for all eternity. Christ desires that everything be done. Did Jesus get what he asked for? Revelation 4 answers that question for us. <clears throat> Revelation 4. After this, I looked and behold a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne stood in heaven with one seated on the throne. And he who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Carnelian, and around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. Around the throne were twenty-four thrones, and seated on the thrones were twenty-four elders, clothed in white garments with golden crowns on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder. And before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was, as it were, a sea of glass like crystal. And around the throne, on each side of the throne, are four living creatures, full of eyes in front and behind. The first living creature like a lion, the second living creature like an ox, the third living creature with the face of a man, and four living creatures like and the fourth living creature like an eagle in flight and the four living creatures each of them with six wings are full of eyes all around and within and day and night they never cease to say holy 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 is the lord god almighty who was and is and is to come and whenever the living creatures give glory and thanks and honor to him who is seated on the throne and who lives forever and ever, the twenty-four elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things. And by your will they existed and were created. Jesus got what he prayed for, didn't he? He ascended to heaven and exists there in glory. And the question for you and I is which side of eternity are we on? Will we, along with the elders, throw down our crowns? in praise and honor and glory? Or will we go away angry to utter darkness? Jesus came so that you can be with him. He came that eternal life and worship might start now. Will you join us? Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your love. We thank you for Jesus Christ. We pray that as we come and worship you, that you would ever cause glory to flow from yourself to us. Thank you for Jesus Christ and all he achieved. In whose name we pray. Amen.